Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad. And we're back with another. Oh, and I'm also in black. Big, bad, back, in black for Fact Friday. So before we get started, we like to do a guitar of the week. And this guitar of the week is the rather lovely Baxendale Cooley Caster. I'm very excited to do this because I get asked about this all the time. I use it in a lot of videos, especially when I'm trying to get a telly sound, or I just want some twang, or just frankly, I want a really good guitar. This is made by the rather amazing Mr. Scott Baxendale. See his logo there, Baxendale. Uh, Scott is a master craftsman, an incredible luthier. He's based in Athens in Georgia, which some of you may know from REM and many other incredible things. It's called a Cooley Caster because it was originally designed and is the main guitar of Mike Cooley, who you probably know as the guitar player, of course, of the drive-by truckers. It is basswood, so it's fairly heavy, but they have chambered it. Scott has chambered it, so if you listen here. But it's still a fairly reasonable amount of wood. So it's a bird's eye maple quarter inch top over a chambered basswood body. It has Lola pickups, which is a Charlie Christian in the neck, and also the Lola Alnico Tele bridge pickup. Both these pickups sound phenomenal, and I use them all the time. But it's also one of the few times on Telecasters I've owned that I go to the middle position, maybe almost as much as I go to the individual pickups. I've got a bit of drive on the amp, let's have a listen. Here is the bridge pickup. <laughs> Twangy, fantastic. Let's go to the neck, the Charlie Christian. Smooth and creamy and... Just... Almost jazz, it's so smooth. Gorgeous sound. Let's go to the two together. Oh. single pickup position is fantastic. This is a really beautiful guitar. So it's called the Cooley Caster. It was originally made and designed for Mike Cooley of the Drive-By Truckers. Um, it's the guitar you see him playing on stage most. I went online and checked it out and he really does. Just a wonderful, wonderful instrument. Now, Scott also is the guy that goes in and does the harmony and silver tone conversions. And we have a few of those as well, where he takes old harmony and silver tone guitars which were originally built with really high quality wood, but the strutting inside was really quite amateur. And so he takes them apart and puts brand new strutting inside and does an amazing job of turning these old antique 40s, 50s, 60s guitars around and turns them into absolutely beautiful instruments. I'm a huge fan, to say the least. I absolutely love them, I use them a lot. And of course, Butch Walker, the incredible producer and amazing songwriter and guitarist in his own right, Mr. Butch Walker uses Baxendale stuff as well. Really great stuff. So there it is. This is the Cooley Caster. Thank you everyone who's been asking about it. I'm very proud to show it off. Is musical talent born or made? Surely some of it comes down to physical gifts. 
I love these kinds of questions because they push at some preconceived ideas and notions. I didn't start playing music myself until I was 15. At 15 years old, it was actually uh, my birthday, give or take a week, I think it was like a week after my birthday, my father and I completed a guitar that we had built together just because I wanted to be Brian May. The reality was, is my father did 99% of the work. I helped with some sanding and gave an opinion or two, but my father essentially built this guitar for me. And it was my first guitar. It was an electric guitar and it was wonderful. So I didn't learn to play the guitar until I was 15. I didn't have a guitar until that one was built. I didn't have one to practice on. So I picked up the guitar maybe a month, a couple of weeks after my 15th birthday. And I can tell you, even though I was a massive musical fan and I collected albums and I had posters of Queen all over my room and all the, the things you would imagine, you know, I was a huge Beatles fan. I didn't pick it up and it wasn't instant. And I just had the same struggles as everybody else. Now, don't get me wrong. There were kids I knew that it seemed easy. They would pick up the guitar. One of my friends, John Hill, John, if you're watching, hello. He had an amazing ear. He was maybe a year ahead of me. He had play, been playing guitar maybe a year or so longer, but it was more than that. It wasn't that he was technically that much better. It was the fact that he would put on a song and instantly work it out. And he had a great, great ear. I didn't. I didn't have a great natural ear. I wasn't hearing a chord sequence and going, oh yeah, that's how to play that. Not like he was. However, I developed that. So how do you define that? Was, he, was that him having natural talent and me not having natural talent? I don't know. And I don't know that I care. Because for me, the difference was between me doing it full time now, doing music full time for a living, and some of my friends that don't do music full time was the amount of hours I put in. And when I say hours, I mean hours. I used to sit there with the guitar at like 16, 17 years old, doing all of the things that guitar players do, you know. You get it, with a metronome you know, for six to eight hours a day, every single day. So natural talent, I don't know, fitting in six to eight hours of practice a day between part-time jobs, going to school and all the things that I did, that's, that's the differentiator for me. That's really all I know. You know, I grew up in a musical family, meaning music was being played all the time, but there was no musicians in my household. There was just people that loved music and it was being played all the time. But that was my first experience of 15 years old of taking what I loved and applying it to an instrument. Now, all the kids around me, John had been going one or two years, but other, other people had been going since they were nine or 10 or 11. And they were already playing songs so much more sophisticated than I was. But I caught them up. I caught them up because I practiced and practiced and practiced. And then at 16, I left home and I joined a club band in the north of England. And for two to three years, I played doing covers. And that really helps develop your ear because you're learning other people's songs and you're playing it night after night after night. And as Keith Richards said, a gig is worth a thousand rehearsals. So all of that practice I was doing was then put into playing shows. So for me, Music's always been what I've done. I've had other jobs to support myself, don't get me wrong, but I've always had an absolutely massive love of music and always have practiced and played music. And of course, as I got older and spent more time on this side of the glass, I got better as an engineer and a producer and as a mixer and as a songwriter. So my personal experience and my honest answer to your question is, is it are you born with natural talent? That's not my experience. Everything was hard for me. I had friends where it came really quickly and easy. The difference is, is like, I do this for a living because I apply myself every single day to get better. 
I can't tell you how many Skype conference calls and stuff I've done with the guitar practicing arpeggios. I probably drive people absolutely nuts. But to me, that's what I am. I'm a musician. I do music. I'm an engineer. I'm a producer. I'm a mixer. Sort of in that order. I always tell people I'm a guitar player first. So if you have any doubts, and I get these emails, I get emails all the time from people who are worried that they don't understand enough about theory or technique and all of that stuff. And I remind them, you know, one of the reasons why we do videos on bands like Joy Division one week, and then I think the next week we did Genesis. So we went from Joy Division to Genesis writing a 13-8 song. Why do we do that? Because I am saying something very, very important that yes, you can push yourself and you can get technically proficient and you can, you can really understand super clever stuff and you can make music as incredible as Genesis. But at the same time, you can also come with passion and attitude and feel and something, most importantly, most importantly, something to say. And then you can do Joy Division. Kraftwerk, um, all of those incredible bands, Noi, all of these bands from all over the world that changed, the Stooges, you know, all the Velvet Underground, all of those bands are just as important. And none of them were virtuosos. None of them understood the modes. They couldn't read music, but they created songs. They have hundreds and sometimes billions of plays because they resonate with people. Music isn't just about the technical isn't just about, you know, being able to shred or know what clever substitution, because music is much bigger than all of us. It is a universal language, whether it be somebody playing a drum and singing a simple melody that touches somebody, or whether it is something incredible like Bartok or something like that, some incredible classical composer or a jazz musician or a jazz composer or anything in between doesn't matter. It all has value. So please, please, please don't think that you have to be born into some incredible you know, situation and have the gift of music bestowed upon you. It's all about what you make of it, whether you want to be the new Joy Division or whether you want to be the new Genesis, doesn't matter. It's all of value. And I can tell you, I'm friends with a lot of incredible musicians that are technically really gifted and their favorite musicians aren't actually like that. They don't worship other shredders. When I worked with Paul Gilbert, for instance, his favorite guitar players, he talked about Neil Sean, who's a fill player and a melody player, and Brian May, who's a fill player and a melody player. And yet Paul Gilbert's like, shredtastic. So just bear that in mind. Don't ever feel less than because you don't think that you're born with the gift of music and and it seems overwhelming all of the talk about you know technique and modes and theory and all that stuff because when you're improvising and writing music that doesn't come into play does it come into play as a sound alike and you're trying to figure out what somebody did of course but I can tell you, all of the composers I've ever worked with, the songwriters I've worked with, the really big successful ones who continually have hits and have massive careers, they don't think that way. They just make music. So don't worry about being born with natural talent. Just apply yourself, work hard, and you can be successful. So for those of you that are in the Produce Like a Pro Academy, this week we have Ruth Nichols, who goes by the name of Mahelani. And she is doing a full writing and recording in her home studio. So you get to follow along and you see the whole process of writing a song from scratch, producing it, and you get to download all the multi-tracks, play along, you know, add parts of your own, mix it. It is, of course, called Produce Like a Pro Academy, so you get to produce as well as mix the tracks. If you're interested in joining the Academy, there is a link below. And for the Academy members, please check out the video and, of course, download the multi-tracks, watch it. It's absolutely fantastic. Ruth is insanely talented. Multi-instrumentalist, also a great trumpet player. Okay, let's do another question. So here's a contentious question. <laughs> Are expensive preamps and converters, the ones that cost multiple thousands, just snake oil and a waste of money? Are the cheap, few hundred dollars, USB interfaces really just as good? 
I think sort of yes and no. I know that sounds like a super vague answer. I do know after watching Julian Klaus's channel, there'll be a link down below, Julian um, guested with us on two interface uh, videos we're doing and is doing another one with us, which is going to be amazing. He specced this stuff out. And I will tell you at a certain price point, they're pretty darn amazing. So, you know, we recently talked about the Audient ID range, the ID4, the ID14. I'm not just singling out Audient. There are other products in that price range, which are phenomenal. And we got great, great results. You can download the multi-tracks. You can check out the videos below. We'll make sure we have clips to those two videos. However, I do know that in that sort of really cheap area, the sort of sub 100 euros or $100, this kind of range, they do have issues. You know, are they issues that will stop you from making music? No, absolutely not. If you've only got a $100 inexpensive I.O., then make music. You can mix it and make it sound incredible. But if you're asking me honestly about a quality difference, yeah, that sort of like 100 and above opens up incredible stuff. I'm talking, not negatively, I'm talking about the sort of $70, $60 starter ones. They're not going to be as good a quality, but are they going to get you something usable? Heck yes. I'll give you an example. We did a song a few years ago with Chris Allen just after he won American Idol. You remember Chris? Great guy. And I've said, told the story before, so sorry if you're going to glaze over, but he did all of his background vocals on his laptop like this. I'm not kidding. He had a pair of headphones on and he sang into the laptop microphone. And the best of my recollection is he sang the vocals in his laptop using the internal microphone, the pair of headphones in an airport lounge. <laughs> and we came to recut the song, like you do. And we're at the beautiful studio, Sunset Sound, Studio 3. We had the best musicians I know. Victor and Drizzle was on drums. Um, just absolutely phenomenal musicians. And we wanted to use Chris to do the background. So we started singing them. Of course, I put up a U47. I was going through a 1073, a nice compression chain. And we started stacking the backgrounds. And we're listening going, it doesn't sound as good as the stacked in the laptop recording. There was something about that internal mic that's probably thin. There's something about the way he stacked it together on his own, the way he blended it. There's more at play than the gear is what I'm trying to say. The gear was not good. It's an internal microphone on a laptop. Of course, it's not high quality. He's using the converter in the laptop. Everything was like cheap, 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 or relatively. But there was so much more at play. There was his voice, the way it was recorded, and the way he blended it, the way he listened to as th things that went down and decided what choice he was going to make. All of those things are 10 times more important than the gear. And you hear me and you hear every talking head say this. It's the song, it's the song, and the song. It is, as Quincy Jones says, it is the song, the song, and the song. Of course it is. And if the song is amazing and the ideas are incredible and the performances are amazing, I don't care and nobody cares whether it's a $60 entry-level interface or a $6,000 you know, single or stereo channel um, I.O. It really doesn't matter. Now, obviously, it does matter in certain situations. If you're going to be in the Vienna symphony hall, you know, recording an orchestra with a massive dynamic range. You really don't want a two-channel, you know, pair of microphones going through a little, you know, interface that has absolutely no headroom that will go into distortion. And you probably don't want something in the middle at about $300. You probably want some really beautiful converters that have massive headroom and are like so crystal clear and perfect and whatever. You want the security of that. Now, don't get me wrong. The $300 one might work if you're back, you know, back off level, give yourself a ton of headroom, probably come pretty darn close. But the reality in those situations, why would anybody who's in a you know, million dollar environment not want to use the best equipment? It's just logic. It doesn't mean that something is 
less than because it's cheaper. It just means they're in this incredible hall with an orchestra that's probably costing $100,000 to be there. I'm not joking. An orchestra date for a movie soundtrack is going to be very expensive. With the best engineers and the best gear, of course they're going to use lots of mics. They're going to spot mic, they're going to mic the room, they're going to mic from the conductor's perspective, and all of that is going to go through really incredibly expensive converters because they need the safety net of having incredible gear with amazing headroom so they don't have any distortion issues. So it's all very, very logical. But for most of us, recording in environments like I have here, if you watch our demos, we're using inexpensive microphones with inexpensive interfaces. And you hear it time and time again. The results are phenomenal because the musicians are great, songs, performances are great. Get what you can afford get going, get creating music. Don't worry about the gear that you have. You should be recording first. Once you're recording and making music, whether it be on a four track cassette or a 48 input Neve, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. You should be getting the ideas down first. Because if you get a great idea down first, maybe you can make some money off it. I don't know. And if you make some money off it, maybe you can buy some better gear. And then maybe with a better gear, you can do something else that generates some income that allows you to buy some better gear. You get what I'm going. So yes, there is a difference between a $60 converter and a $6,000 converter. Of course there is. But don't think, just like we were talking about with the, you know, whether you're a shredder and whether you can read music and whether you understand modes and theory and chord substitution. Don't let that world put you off from making music. Expensive equipment should not stop you making music. Just because you look behind me and you go, oh, wow, Warren's got some Poltex. Well, you know what? I've had those Poltex for about eight or nine years. I've been making music professionally for close to 30-something years. So in 30 years of doing what I love, the last quarter to a third of the time, I've had really expensive equipment around me. It's not it didn't stop me from making great records. It didn't stop me from having number one albums. I recorded um, the drums on How to Save a Life through a, an AMEC console and some BAE mic pre's and some API mic pre's. That was all I had. And it was kind of like botched together. The toms were going back through the AMEX. The hi-hat was going through the AMEX. All we did was we put the kick and the snare and the rooms and maybe the overheads went through one pair of runes, definitely, but the toms, hats, and other stuff was going through the TAC. I say AMEC, it's actually their budget range, Attack Scorpion. And that was a massive number one hit. And that sold millions and millions of copies. And it is, I believe, at one stage was the most downloaded song of all time when iTunes sold lots of downloads. It was that, it was the most played what we call it, like in movies and TV shows. It was in more movies and TV shows than any other song at that time. It broke record after record after record, and it was just recorded with gear that we had, the best that we had available. And I think that is a much, much bigger message. It was all about the song and the singer and had little to do with the gear. The gear was good enough to get a great result. And sometimes good enough in the gear not sometimes, all the time, good enough when it comes to equipment is absolutely fine because the song, the song, the performance, the song, the performance, the song will always out, outclass that. If you said to somebody like Al Schmidt, Nico Bolas, any of those incredible engineers, Tommy Vaccari, if you asked any of them what would they rather have, an amazing artist with incredible songs and a great performance, or the best studio, they're always going to take amazing artist, incredible performance, great song, always. Guarantee it. Thanks ever so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir, adios, adio. Tschüss. Um, of course, don't forget to leave a bunch of comments and questions below. This is where we go to pick up future frequently asked questions down below. Thanks ever so much. Mm -hmm.